What should politicians do with their time? Ban all second jobs for MPs. I don't have any objection um, to MPs having a, a, an insight into the outside world. Second jobs divide MPs and often anger their voters. You get paid the best part of 90 grand a year, that should be enough. We voted them in to run this country, so that's what they should do. Sky News' Westminster Accounts Project has followed the money through our political system. Now we reveal the scale of MPs' commitment to their second jobs. For the first time, we can show you the total of how much time MPs say they spend on their outside work. Nearly 89,000 hours, that's the total amount of time all MPs have worked in second jobs over the course of this parliament, so three and a half years. Let's see how it all breaks down. These are the MPs who commit the most hours to their second jobs. Now, some names in there you might recognise. Sir Geoffrey Cox. They've become notorious for their commitment to outside work. But most have one thing in common. All the names on this list have second jobs in politics. Councillors, mayors, members of the Scottish Parliament. Double political jobbing keeping them very busy. And something else we can show you for the very first time. This is the average hourly wage of an MP in a second job. £233 per hour. How does that compare to the rest of the population? Well, it's a lot higher. The average hourly wage for an MP in a second job is over 17 times the average rate for a member of the UK public and more than 22 times the minimum hourly wage. Which MPs are getting the most cash for the hours they work? This leaderboard shows you that. These 20 MPs have the highest hourly rates in Parliament. The name at the top is no surprise. Boris Johnson, now free to spend even more time earning big bucks away from Westminster. The second name on this list is the shortest lived PM in British history. But that has hardly dented her earnings power, Liz Truss. Her most lucrative work since leaving number 10 has been a speech in Taiwan, paid at a rate of £20,000 an hour, nearly one and a half thousand times the UK average hourly wage for her insights into global diplomacy. And that's part of a very common pattern. MPs who've served in government dominate this leaderboard. 18 of the MPs with the highest hourly earnings this parliament have government experience. Clearly a very lucrative addition to any parliamentarian CV. Plans for major second job reforms have frozen in this parliament. Is it just a matter of time until voters force a change? Sam Coates, Sky News. It wouldn't be the first U-turn that he's made. Um, Matthew Taylor, doctors clearly not minded to accept this offer. Even if they did, can the NHS afford it? Well, it doesn't look to us uh, at first glance as though the uh, what's been identified by the Prime Minister and the chance of the, the, as, as the money that will be available to pay for the gap between uh, this offer and what's in the budget it will will be adequate. And I think it's really important to understand the context in, in which this is taking place. So, you know, in the NHS, we have something called the planning round where trusts and systems agree their targets for the year ahead, targets in terms of improving efficiency and in terms of performance in areas like waiting lists. And I think every leader in the health service will tell you that that planning round was really tough this year and that they have set targets which are you know many of them will say to me 105 percent level of the level they think is realistic so we are already in a situation where it's very very hard for us to meet our financial and performance targets there simply is no fat on the bone so we'll be interrogating the figures very carefully because if is if more money is taken out of the health service it will have an impact uh, on services and in simple terms if you can what would that mean at the moment, if you were forced to, to fund this pay offer, what would it mean day to day for the health service? Well, it would mean what the Prime Minister calls reprioritisation. And what that means is there are things that we won't be able to do. And in a sense, you get an insight into that. You know, today is the first day of a five day junior doctor strike. We have maintained accident and emergency. We will continue to undertake uh, urgent operations, for example, for people with cancer patients. But in many, many hospitals, they've had to stop elective. Uh, um, care, elective operations and outpatient appointments, which means that more people will join 
those waiting lists that uh, has been announced to got even longer today. So uh, patient services will be jeopardized. And actually, you know, as you said in the report, the prime minister's own waiting list pledge will be jeopardized. Uh, Dr. Trevedi, I mean, given all of that, given what is deemed by many to be the parlour state of the NHS already with waiting lists, um, what will be your next course of action? Our next course of action uh, will be, uh, we, well, we remain open now to, to enter back into negotiations. We can use this um, suggestion and, and an offer from the DDRB as a, a basis to, to further negotiations. And if we're met with a, a government who treat us reasonably, who, who are able to work towards a credible offer, then we don't need to call for any further strike action. But it's important to note that actually during our previous uh, set of negotiations in May, the government had sight of this DDRB report. They knew what the supposedly independent pay review body wanted to recommend, but still refused to offer us anything more than 5%, Doctor. which is less than what this uh, DDRB report suggested. Very briefly, uh, Anita Smith, the government has said this is about reprioritisation. Repri if the money goes to public sector workers, it has to come out elsewhere. Across the board, do you anticipate cuts to services? Of course, yeah. I mean, you can't, we can't magic money out of, uh, of nowhere. So there will be. The reprioritisation in schools will mean that there'll be cuts to staffing, bigger class sizes, and parents will really start to notice that if they haven't already. Anita Smith, Dr Vivek Trevedi, Matthew Taylor, thank you so much thank for joining you. us. Please join the conversation. Put your comments and suggestions below in the comment section. Thank you for subscribing to this news channel. You will be notified of any breaking news and new post as you become part and parcel of the TAO Media family. Please like and share TAO Media. We love you all. Please support TAO Media Foundation by joining membership and visiting Amazon UK to purchase the displayed books to aid our orphanage projects across Africa.